Well, we have an august panel of experts, so we best start on time. Uh, I want to thank everybody uh, to this meeting of the Subcommittee on Commodity Markets, Digital Assets, and Rural Development. It has the rather clunky abbreviation of COMDAR. Uh, staff were instructed to find something better, but I guess that's the best that we could do, uh, so be it. We do have a lot of uh, work to dig into this year, and I'm excited to get started. Of course, today's hearing is on digital assets, but it's hardly the only thing that we're collectively going to be working on together. I mean, clearly rural development is going to be really important, particularly in light of that title of the Farm Bill. Uh, we also have the Commodities Future uh, Trading Corporation, or Commission rather, which is going to be important, particularly given the fact that we have had uh, both the uh, chairman and the ranking member commit to doing uh, reauthorization of the CFTC this year. Uh, and I look forward to working with uh, Chair Caraveo and others on the committee uh, on that work. But today, we are tasked with examining uh, digital asset markets and I think most importantly, understanding what are the gaps in this regulatory framework and how are those gaps harming innovators and consumers alike. And, and as I mentioned, we have an august panel to help walk us through that. Uh, I think uh, it would be an unfortunate deficiency if we didn't take a moment to call out the nearly unprecedented level of cooperation and collaboration that we have had with the House uh, Financial Services Committee. This is a town where people very much like to fight over turf and where egos can sometimes get in the way of progress, but that group is convening at this exact same moment a complimentary hearing dealing with the same general topic. What are the gaps in the regulatory framework and how can we work together uh, to address them? And in fact, next month, the collaboration gets even closer insofar as we have a joint hearing to examine these issues together, and those are, are not typical in this town. And that cooperation is a testament uh, to the importance that both Chairman McHenry and Chairman Thompson, as well as uh, you know the teams on both sides of the aisle, have had to getting things done on digital assets this Congress. Uh, a lot of ink has been spilled on digital assets, uh, a lot of it breathlessly positive, a lot of it angrily negative. Uh, I think uh, reasonable people understand that uh, digital assets and the underlying blockchain chains can bring a tremendous amount of opportunity. There have, uh, they can also be filled with a fair amount of hype. And we know that in this marketplace, as in every marketplace, there are fraudsters and hucksters uh, that seek uh, to make money while unfortunately giving uh, the whole industry a bad name. And uh, there are uh, the hits and misses are well known to all of us. You have hits like Ethereum, Hedera, Filecoin, and then you have outfits like Banana Coin, Kodak Coin, and Mooncoin. So those are the, uh, the highs and the lows. Uh, the difficult task we're starting today, and, and we're really not starting it. I know there have been lots of informal conversations over the course of months, and even some work done in the last Congress. Uh, but the work that we uh, begin anew today is to craft a legislative framework that will allow the next Ethereum or Filecoin to emerge, while at the same time protecting the public from the hype, the scams, and the frauds that we have seen all too much of uh, in the last few years. Uh, this task is bigger than any single person, committee, or agency, and in a town that so often prefers food fights to collaboration, it's gonna take a pretty substantial collective effort uh, on our part here to make sure that we get it right. Uh, in this effort, there's plenty of work for regulatory agencies. It's not just Congress alone. We'll be looking to smart folks in industry, smart folks at the CFTC and the SEC, as well as uh, our state banking regulators uh, to make sure that we hit the center of the bullseye. So I'm looking forward to today's hearing and the ongoing collaboration with House Financial Services. And without any further ado, I would turn to uh, Ranking Member Cara Vale for her comments. Well, thank you, Chairman Johnson, for convening today's inaugural subcommittee hearing on this important topic. It is an honor to serve as ranking member of the Commodity Markets, Digital Assets, and Rural Development Subcommittee. I appreciate the opportunity to work with Chairman Johnson as we identify regulatory gaps in the digital assets industry and look 
towards solutions. And in the future, opportunities are such as our subcommittee also works to improve the livelihoods of our rural communities. We have an impressive panel of witnesses before us, and I look forward to hearing from them all. Over the past several years, there has been a tremendous amount of volatility in the digital assets industry. In February last year, the industry had a combined market capitalization of approximately $2 trillion. Today, however, that number is closer to $1 trillion, with Bitcoin alone accounting for about $500 billion. We have seen catastrophic failures in the space, including the collapse of FTX, and dramatic shifts in market capitalization over relatively short periods of time. Even with the Commodity Futures Trading Commission's limited authorities to regulate digital commodity cash markets, the CFTC has to date brought 70 enforcement actions involving digital asset commodities, and such cases comprised of more than 20% of all enforcement actions uh, filed in the last fiscal year. Considering these events, it is vital we closely examine current regulations to ensure investors are appropriately protected and that our agencies have the necessary authorities to oversee this new and evolving, evolving industry. Unlike most of the typical, typical commodity market investors under CFTC regulation, a significant number of digital commodity cash market investors are individual retail investors. That means volatility and failures in these digital assets classes disproportionately impact everyday people and families. For sufficient customer protection, we must consider the everyday person's lower risk tolerance and ensure that appropriate disclosures are readily accessible and clearly communicated. In considering any digital assets legislation, I would re be remiss not to emphasize that we must also include the appropriate funding for the CFTC to continue carrying out its mission of promoting the integrity, resilience, and vibrancy of the U.S. Derivative, derivatives market through sound regulation. The CFTC is the only federal financial regulator that relies solely on appropriations from Congress. It is therefore our responsibility to ensure any additional, additional authorities and oversight of a technologically complex and unique industry comes with additional resources. Failure to include the appropriate funding would severely undercut any efforts to reach a comprehensive and cohesive regulatory framework for the digital asset industry that incentivizes innovation and protects customers. With that, I'd like to thank our witnesses for agreeing to testify today. I sincerely appreciate your willingness to be here and the expertise that you all bring to this conversation, and I look forward to a productive exchange. Thank you, Chairman, and I yield back my time. Thank you much. And if uh, either Chairman uh, Thompson or uh, Ranking Member Scott uh, come and, and would like to make some open comments, of course, we'll provide them uh, that opportunity. Anybody else who would like to make opening remarks, uh, we would just ask that you submit those for the record, and uh, we'll make sure that they're included. We uh, have a, a panel which will introduce uh, a number of you are experienced testifiers, so I don't need to tell you this, but you've got the time in front of you. Each member will only be given five minutes to uh, hopefully ask questions. Sometimes they make speeches, and I guess that's okay, too. Uh, it will remain green until I believe there is one minute left on the clock, at which point it will turn yellow. When it hits zero, uh, you'll get a red light, and if uh, you're going on and on, you'll hear a very light tapping from me. At about uh, 20 seconds, it will get more insistence, now, and more insistent. Uh, we do want you to have an opportunity to at least answer the question a bit, understanding that you will follow up um, uh, afterwards to fill out the evidentiary record. But if a member with only six seconds left has tossed it to you, we'll give you 20 seconds to try to address their comments at least a little bit. Uh, but we do want to keep it moving. We'll have uh, lots of good questions and a lot of good discussions. So unless there's anything else for the go to the order, I will uh, introduce each of our panelists and then provide them each uh, their time to make their, uh, their remarks. Okay. So our first witness today is Mr. Daniel Davis, who is a partner and the co-chair of Financial Markets and Regulation at the Catton uh, Muchen uh, Rosenman uh, firm. Previously, he was the general counsel at the CFTC. We also have uh, Ms. Pervy uh, Maniar, who is the deputy general counsel, uh, counsel at Falcon X Holdings. Our third witness is uh, Nilmeni Rubin, who's the head of global policy at Hedera. Our fourth witness is Mr. Timothy uh, Mossad. Mr. Mossad currently serves as a research fellow at the Kennedy School of Government at Harvard and is the director of the MRCBG Digital Assets Policy Projects. He was, as I suspect many of you know, also a former chairman of the CFTC. Uh, 
Our fifth and final witness today is Mr. Joseph A. Hall, who is a partner at Davis Polk and Wardwell. He's formerly managing executive for policy at the SEC. I want to thank uh, all of our witnesses for joining us today. And with that, Mr. Davis, you are on the clock. Thank you, Chairman Johnson, Ranking Member Caraveo, Ranking, uh, Chairman Thompson, Ranking Member Scott, and members of the subcommittee. Thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today. As Chairman Johnson mentioned, my name is Dan Davis. I am co-chair of the Financial Markets and Regulation Practice at Catton. From 2017 to 2021, I had the honor of serving as general counsel at the CFTC. I'd like to thank my wife, Liz, and son, Spencer, for joining me today, and say hello to my daughters, Catherine and Abigail, who will be watching this hearing when they return home from school. My views expressed today are in my personal capacity and not on behalf of any person, private sector agency, or government agency. Today's topic is identifying the regulatory gaps in spot market regulation of digital assets. My view can be summarized as this. There is a significant gap in federal spot market regulation because the large majority of digital asset spot market activity falls outside the regulatory jurisdiction of both the CFTC and the SEC. To explain how I reached this conclusion, I will discuss the jurisdiction of both agencies and how they have exercised their authority regarding the spot market for digital assets. The major dividing line between CFTC and SEC authority is whether a product is a security or not. If a product is a security or is based on a security, the SEC generally has jurisdiction over that product. So this would include not only securities themselves, but security futures and security-based swaps. The SEC has regulatory jurisdiction, which means it can require registration, require compliance with the securities laws and regulations, and to conduct exams and reviews. It can also bring enforcement actions. If a product is not a security, then it likely is within some level of CFTC jurisdiction. The CFTC has full regulatory authority over a number of products, such as futures, options on futures, and swaps. These all have their counterparts of FCC jurisdiction. Futures, security futures, swaps, security-based swaps. The CFTC has regulatory jurisdiction over a couple of other products with a specific retail component, such as certain retail foreign exchange transactions and certain leveraged or margined retail commodity transactions. Over all of these products, the CFTC can require registration, require compliance with all applicable statutes and regulations, including robust customer protection provisions, and conduct exams and reviews. So what ju CFTC jurisdiction remains? If there is a spot product that is outside the CFTC regulatory authority for leveraged or margined retail commodity products, the CFTC only has enforcement authority for fraud, manipulation, or false reporting regarding that product. This is a backwards-looking authority to punish bad conduct after it has already occurred. No registration, no exams by the CFTC. Congress gave the CFTC this authority because the prices in the spot market significantly impact the futures and swaps products. And the CFTC has not hesitated to use its enforcement authority in the digital asset space, bringing over 80 enforcement actions related to digital assets, including 20% of its enforcement activity in the past year. Where does that leave us? If a digital asset activity occurs on the spot market, it's not a security, it's not a leveraged retail commodity product, then there is no CFTC or SEC regulatory authority over that product. There is only CFTC enforcement jurisdiction. How large is that universe? It is large, and I base that on two key assumptions. First, I looked at the top 15 digital assets by market capitalization. Now, there are thousands of digital assets, but the top 15 account for about 86% of the market. Second, I look to what the commissions themselves have said about those 15 digital assets. Not a chairman, not a commissioner, but the commission itself, because only commission can speak for itself. Based on my review and looking at CFTC and SEC enforcement actions, it appears that the CFTC has asserted that seven of the top 15 digital assets are commodities. These seven digital assets are some of the largest, accounting for approximately 76% of the digital asset market. The SEC, as a commission, has never challenged any of those CFTC determinations, some of which have been around for years. Instead, the SEC, in an enforcement action, has asserted that only one of the top 15 digital assets is a security, and that digital asset currently accounts for about 2% of the market. 76 to 2. 76% of commodity, 2% of security, and the rest of the top 15, about 8% undetermined. I don't think that should be very surprising. 
because the market division between swaps regulated by the, S the CFTC and securities-based swaps regulated by the SEC is about 90% swaps for the CFTC and 10% security-based swaps for the SEC. So I conclude where I began. There's a significant regulatory gap in federal spot market regulation of digital assets because the large majority of digital asset spot market activity falls outside the regulatory jurisdiction of the CFTC and the SEC. Thank you. And even before the insistent knocking began, very good. Uh, you should be proud of your father, uh, our guest. He did a great job. Ma'am, you are up and on the clock. Chairman Johnson, Chairman Thompson, Ranking Member Carveo, and members of the subcommittee, thank you for this opportunity to testify before you today. In my testimony, I will endeavor to provide Falcon X's perspective on the current regulatory landscape for digital assets and the benefits of coordinated regulation and responsible innovation in this realm. Falcon X is a prime broker in the digital asset space for the world's leading institutions, and Falcon X Bravo is proud to be a CFTC registered swap dealer. Our mission is to provide secure, efficient, and regulatory compliant access to these markets for our clients. Our institutional only business includes regulated over the counter derivatives with digital asset underliers. By employing time-tested OTC market structures and state-of-the-art technology, we enable our customers to hedge risk or gain financial exposure in this space. We are committed to orderly, fair, and liquid markets for all market participants. We are happy and eager to engage with policymakers and regulators to provide industry insights on this critical issue and recommend potential areas for further legislative clarity. Digital asset technology is underpinned by the blockchain and paves the way for innovative growth while offering more secure, transparent, and decentralized alternatives to traditional structures. The technology can better facilitate control over the sharing and storing of information. As an example of this innovation can be seen in the blockchain networks such as Ethereum, which have multiple significant use cases and benefits. Ethereum's groundbreaking feature is smart contracts, which have the ability to execute contracts without intermediaries. It is evident that the existing rules and tools at our disposal are insufficient to address the unique challenges presented by this dynamic technology. I go into more detail regarding the real world utility and use cases of such digital asset commodities in my written testimony. As the digital asset industry has evolved, different US regulators have issued their respective rules and guidance oftentimes resulting in inconsistent enforcement and an opaque and sometimes conflicting regulatory regime. There is no clear single regulator of digital assets in the US, and many regulators have claimed some form of jurisdiction, each with their own authorities and regulatory objectives. While it is not uncommon for an industry to be subject to multiple regulators, a clear lack of, over, a lack of clear oversight and jurisdictional lines creates barriers to entry and confusion for a nascent industry. The absence of regulatory clarity in the US has hindered our global competitiveness in this dynamic but still emerging industry. This moment calls for the United States to take resolute action and to assert leadership in the development of an unambiguous digital asset regulation. We believe that the majority of digital assets are used and traded like commodities. In part, this is why Falcon X decided to actively pursue CFTC registration as the best suited available regulatory framework for digital assets in which Falcon X makes markets and trades. It should be noted that CFTC registered swap dealers are subject to very robust regulatory requirements, many of which I have set out in more detail in my written testimony. While some digital assets may be securities, the securities regulatory structure is ill-suited for most digital assets. SEC mandated disclosures designed for factors like earnings, cash flow, or material events have no analogy for digital asset commodities and would prevent many of their benefits, such as peer-to-peer -peer transactions. The current US regulatory framework is fragmented, and until this is addressed, it will continue to lead to a loss of economic opportunity and technological advancement for the US. We believe that spot markets would benefit from the application of some of the CFTC's business conduct standards, in particular those focused on registration, reporting, and disclosure. At Falcon X, we have found that these rules greatly enhance our ability to 
foster a transparent and orderly market for digital asset derivatives. Tailored to the unique characteristics of a digital asset spot market, we believe they could greatly enhance market integrity and promote market participation, confidence, and protection while facilitating innovation. We firmly believe that Congress and market regulators should work together to establish a framework for the digital asset ecosystem so that we can ensure that digital asset market participants and markets are safe, transparent, and orderly for all participants. Legislation like the Digital Commodity Exchange Act achieves just this, and we applaud Chairman Thompson, Chairman Johnson, and the rest of this committee for their leadership in this regard in the last Congress. We look forward to this committee's efforts to advance legislation in cooperation and coordination with the House Financial Services Committee. Let me reiterate Falcon X's appreciation for this opportunity to testify in front of you this afternoon, and I look forward to answering any questions you have. Thank you. We are two for two on time. Mrs. Rubin, the, uh, the pressure mounts. You're up. <laughs> Thank you, Chairman Johnson, Ranking Member Caraveo, members of the subcommittee for inviting me to testify. As today is Take Your Child's Work Day, my husband has brought two of our three daughters here today. I am Nilmani Rubin, Head of Global Policy for the Hedera Governing Council, a decentralized multi-stakeholder governing body that establishes policies for the open source Hedera network. Hedera is a fast and green distributed ledger or a public blockchain. Essentially, Hedera provides a layer of trusted internet infrastructure for applications with real world impact. What we call the internet is a set of computers talking to each other through open protocols. These protocols have evolved over time to enable additional features and capabilities that benefit society. Initially, protocols enabled only read-only text, or Web 1. Then they enabled posting content and conducting commerce, or Web 2. And now they enable personal control of data, or Web 3. Public blockchains are Web 3 platforms for other applications and are operated by a network of independent computers or nodes. Now, these nodes do not fund their operations by showing advertisements or selling subscriptions. Instead, nodes are paid by users directly through fees, like water electricity. Node fees are typically tiny and frequent, with hundreds or thousands of transactions processed per second. It is not possible to use the traditional financial system to send fractions of a penny quickly, efficiently, and globally. To solve this problem, public blockchains use a digital asset or cryptocurrency to rapidly transfer value between users and node operators. The cryptocurrency serves as a fuel on which the network runs. For example, in March, the Hedera network processed over 1 billion transactions. Each transaction cost between a tenth and a hundredth of a penny and was paid in the Hedera network's cryptocurrency called HBAR. The key takeaway here is that public blockchains need digital assets to operate. The ability of blockchains to provide trusted and time-stamped records enables people to store, track, and monitor data in new and powerful ways. Three examples of products running on the Hedera network include the Dovu Marketplace that allows farmers to generate additional income from actions like changing farming techniques and planting additional crops. Their actions are tokenized as carbon credits to fund carbon-reducing projects. The second one is Atma IO, built by Avery Dennison. It helps brands reduce waste across the supply chain for over 28 billion items. It has both economic and environmental benefits. And third, everywhere. It monitors vaccine cold chain storage across the supply chain and picks up on any irregularities before administering those vaccine to patients, keeping patients safe. U.S. network and market infrastructure providers need a complete roadmap towards compliance. The current U.S. regulatory environment provides no clear path to compliance for digital assets, leaving blockchains with two choices, either stop operating in the U.S. or hope U.S. policy will come through before the enforcement of misaligned regulations. 
To protect consumers, enable innovation, and promote competition, we recommend Congress pass legislation creating an activities-based framework to regulate digital assets based on the nature of the transaction. First, Congress should provide a definition of and delineation between digital commodity and digital security, or state when a digital asset is neither. Second, Congress should empower the CFTC to regulate certain digital commodity activities, such as operating a centralized spot marketplace. To extend U.S. leadership and competitiveness, Congress should establish digital asset policy that supports the use of public blockchains. The rest of the world is recognizing the, the potential blockchains. Other jurisdictions, such as Dubai, Europe, Singapore, and the United Kingdom, are creating digital asset regulatory certainty. The United States risks shutting out businesses that rely on digital assets to operate, risks shutting out the ability to regulate the industry, and most importantly, risks removing the American people's access to the efficiency, transparency, and data storage tools that the rest of the world will be using to their competitive advantage. Thank you for focusing on policy for the next wave of digital innovation. Very well said. Mr. Massad, you are up. Three for three. <laughs> Chairman Thompson, Chairman Johnson, Ranking Member Caraveo, members of the committee and staff, I am honored to be testifying before you today. It is almost a decade since I first testified before this committee about the lack of a comprehensive regulatory framework for crypto. Four years ago, I wrote a paper on the need to strengthen regulation, which began with the following sentence. There is a gap in the regulation of crypto assets that Congress needs to fix. That gap still exists today, of course, and it is the absence of a federal regulator for the spot market in crypto tokens that are not securities, as has been explained. And it is a principal reason why investor protection in the crypto market is extremely weak, and that was made painfully obvious by the failures of several crypto firms last year, such as FTX, which resulted in hundreds of thousands of people suffering losses. Now, there are other gaps. I've noted some of those in my written testimony, but I will focus on this one. For years now, I have said that either the SEC or the CFTC needs to be given the authority and the resources to regulate that spot market. Today, I want to suggest to you that there is another path forward, an easier path forward, and it addresses the fact that the lack of investor protection is also related to this debate about whether crypto tokens should be considered securities or commodities or something else. Industry participants complain about the lack of regulatory clarity, but trading and lending platforms also claim they are dealing only in tokens that are securities, thereby avoiding direct federal oversight. SEC Chair Gensler, on the other hand, says most tokens are securities, and the problem is a lack of compliance with existing requirements. While the SEC has brought enforcement actions on this issue, that path could take a long time to reach sufficient clarity. And while there are legislative proposals to address this issue by revising regulatory categories, I am concerned those could generate as much confusion as clarity. There is an alternative path forward. It would increase investor protection quickly without rewriting decades of law or diminishing the existing authority of either the SEC or the CFTC. The investor protection standards we need are largely the same regardless of whether a token falls in the securities or commodities bucket. Therefore, Congress would pass a law mandating that any trading or lending platform that trades Bitcoin or Ethereum must comply with a core set of principles unless that platform has already registered with the SEC or the CFTC. The principles would include protection of customer assets, prevention of fraud and manipulation, prohibition of conflicts of interest, and others, as I've set forth in my written statement. Congress would direct the SEC and the CFTC to develop joint rules implementing these principles or create a self-regulatory organization, SRO, to do so. This approach has several advantages. First, it's simple. The requirements would apply to any trading or lending platform that trades Bitcoin or Ethereum. That captures almost all of the market, if not the entire market. Second, it focuses on the core of the problem. Over 90% of spot trading prop, uh, volume takes place on centralized intermediaries. This approach would dramatically raise the level of investor protection on those platforms. 
simply eliminating wash trading, where someone trades with themselves or an affiliate to inflate the, inflate the price and, or trading volume of an asset, and which has been estimated to represent 50 to 90 percent of the volume on many platforms, would be a huge improvement. And of course, the rules can also be customized to apply to decentralized platforms. Third, it's practical. It's based on the market as it exists today. It would not require a bifurcation of trading into one platform for security tokens and one for commodity tokens. And that's useful because actual trading takes place in pairs of tokens that can often be in different buckets. In addition, by using an SRO, the industry could be required to pay for the cost of the approach. You would not have to allocate money. The approach would not involve rewriting existing securities or commodities laws. And such pr proposals might not only fail to bring clarity uh, to crypto, they might unintentionally undermine decades of regulation and jurisprudence. In particular, the law should make clear that the CFTC and SEC would retain their existing authority. The SEC could still contend that any particular token is a security, and if it prevailed, the intermediary would have to stop dealing in that token or move it to a registered platform. But the intermediary would not be shut down. That would assure platforms and their customers that operations will continue on a far more responsible basis. The approach, finally, is incremental. While comprehensiveness is desirable, it can take a long time to build consensus. I believe it's better to do something incremental that can protect millions of investors and serve as a foundation which can be improved over time. This is essentially the same thing that former SEC Chair Jay Clayton and I proposed uh, in a Wall Street Journal op-ed. Um, and the point is that this is a proposal that can uh, be supported by people regardless of one's view of the value of, of crypto, whether you're breathlessly positive or angrily ne negative, I believe you said, Mr. Chairman. And it's a proposal on both si uh, people on both sides of the political aisle can support. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Mr. Hall, you are recognized for five minutes. Chairman Johnson, Ranking Member Caraveo, and members of the subcommittee. I'm Joe Hall, and I'm a partner in the law firm of Davis, Polk, and Wardwell. The question of where blockchain-based digital assets fit in our regulatory framework frustrates businesses and divides and continues to divide regulators. I believe the lack of certainty has had real costs in terms of consumer confidence and protection, lost economic activity, and unnecessary hurdles to competing with foreign markets. And so when I hear that blockchain technology has not lived up to the hype, I sometimes wonder how we would even know. At the root of the problem is a simple observation. Many kinds of digital assets are inherently different from the stocks, bonds, options, and futures that our existing regulatory structures were built for. Digital assets may not represent a claim on the revenues or assets of a business or look much like the agricultural products, natural resources, or financial commodities that pri with prices that need to be hedged. Instead, digital assets might be deployed to verify the transa a transaction between two strangers, or to facilitate decision making by a, di a dispersed network of coders, or to encourage honest behavior in the fulfillment of an obligation. Because they combine functionality with easy tradability, one can say that digital assets are in fact different in kind from what preceded them. Now, our system of financial market regulation depends on the ability to distinguish securities from commodities. And so we have to determine whether digital assets are securities under SEC jurisdiction or commodities under CFTC jurisdiction. And as it turns out, it's not so clear. The Supreme Court says that, quote, when a purchaser is motivated uh, by a desire to use or consume the item purchased, the securities laws do not apply. Now, different federal and state regulators, including the SEC and the CFTC, have taken conflicting positions on whether some of the most common digital assets are securities. And the SEC suggests market participants should consider a list of 50 or 60 different characteristics, none of which is necessarily determinative, on the understanding that when their presence is stronger, then it is more likely that the digital asset is a security. And now that is not a recipe for predictability. It is not easy for businesses to plan and invest when the answer to their most pressing question is, maybe what you want to do is OK, but maybe it's not. Given this uncertainty, a couple of questions naturally arise. Why not just register with the SEC? 
And given how well trod the path of SEC registration is, are people who take the position that their digital assets are commodities simply behaving as scoff laws? That has not been my experience. The problem is today, registering with the SEC is not a practical alternative. First, the obligations that attach to securities make it impractical to use them in everyday transactions. And that's because the securities framework was built for passive investment instruments, and virtually everyone who touches them is subject to extensive regulation by the SEC in ways that, frankly, are, make sense for debt and equity securities. This framework wasn't built to govern commercial activities like sending a payment. And despite the rise of blockchain technology over the last 10 years, the SEC has taken no apparent action to adapt its rulebook to facilitate activities involving digital assets. Second, even if the SEC did adapt its rules, market participants would continue to face insurmountable ba barriers to conducting business across state lines. And that's because each state regulates the sale of securities, each with its own registration process, and digital assets are not exempt. There is no coordination among states on digital assets, and businesses who try to register will find themselves quickly facing a gauntlet of 50 different state securities commissioners. If there were practical routes to registration, then I'm confident that many businesses would in fact register. But today, the security or not question means that if a digital asset is a security, then we regulate it out of existence, or at least out of the United States, but if it isn't, then consumers lack reliable information in the protection of federal market oversight. I don't believe it's practical to task the regulators with sorting this out. Our, our, our approach to financial regulation relies on competition, and it relies on the fact, uh, or the, the, it relies on our federal financial regulators pushing against the boundaries of their jurisdiction. I believe that competition among the regulators is a feature, not a bug of our system. So I believe it's time to move past the tired debate over whether digital assets are securities under existing law. Congress should instead step in with a new regulatory approach tailored to this asset class. Concepts drawn from the federal securities and commodities laws can inform our new paradigm, but regulators will need clear direction from Congress on how these precedents should apply. I appreciate the committee's time today and look forward to answering your questions. Thank you. Excellent job, panelists. Uh, thank you very much. And for the families of uh, Mrs. Rubin and uh, Mr. Davis who are around it, at the conclusion of the hearing, if you'd like to get a picture with your parents up here with Ranking Member Kara Veo and I, uh, or without me, just with her, <laughs> uh, we can certainly make that happen as a, a commemorative photo. Uh, I will rec recognize myself for five minutes. Uh, Mr. Davis, I want to start with you. Well, I think every panelist talked about a lack of certainty impairing the marketplace. Uh, they talked about it in different ways, but I think they all hit on it. And so in your testimony, you mentioned that the CFTC and the SEC have had uh, some disagreements about classification, and we need look no further than uh, Ether, where we have had the CFTC routinely state that it is a commodity. The SEC agreed for a time, but now we have Chair Gensler who's hinted around the margins that perhaps uh, the change in their validation status might change their classification as a commodity. So Mr. Davis, tell us, those kinds of conf conflicting statements, what impact do they have on the market and product development? Well, as someone who's practices in this space, it's, it's very difficult to give advice uh, to clients who come to us, um, you know, very diligent citizens who very much want to follow the law. Uh, they're very interested in technology, they're fascinated with the possibilities that technology creates, and they're, they're not lawyers. And they come to us and they say, look, we want to follow the law, we want to do what's right, just tell us how to do it. Uh, and so when you have uh, those conflicting statements regarding any type of a digital asset, it creates uncertainty. Now, I think, as, as I noted in my testimony, I think the case for Bitcoin and Ether being non-securities is strongest, right? The CFTC has been saying, with respect to Bitcoin, for almost 10 years now that it's a commodity, and with respect to Ether, uh, not nearly as long, but for at least five years. And the other thing that's happened with Bitcoin and Ether is both of those products have been trading on CFTC-regulated markets for years now. And so what I, what I like to tell people is, look, you know, Bitcoin and Ether are the clearest cases uh, for something not being a security. And th as has been alluded to, those two digital assets account for roughly two thirds uh, of the market capitalization. And so if, if, even if you just square away uh, the categorization of simply those two digital assets, 
you have given clarity to two-thirds of the market. Yeah, very well said. And then Mr. Hall, I, don't, uh, I didn't hear it in your verbal testimony, but in your written testimony, you talked about uh, a non-exclusive list of 50 to 60 characteristics that the SEC can rely upon, none of which is necessarily determinative, and they may result in regulatory outcomes which are not uh, uh, reproducible, predictable, or certain. Uh, I think I know what each of those words mean, but I guess I'd like a little more meat on the bone, sir. What do they mean in this context, and uh, why is that problematic? Sure, uh, thank you. Um, look, it, 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 regulators and the private bar, or the uh, you know the regulated, need to be able to look at the facts um, of 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 their asset. They need to be able to look at the facts of their activities, and they need to be able to draw a conclusion about whether their proposed activity is subject to regulation, and if so, how is it subject to regulation? So we have to speak a common language, um, and, and, and a common language needs to, needs to have you know, rules that, that, that we all understand, that we all understand the consequences of it. Um, if, if the question is, is this digital asset a security, and, that, that, and that's the, the basic question that we face um, in, any, in, any, um, uh, in, in any digital asset activity. If, if the answer is, here's a list of 50 factors that you need to consider, and none of them is determ determinative, and uh, so therefore, no matter how many you tote up in that list, ultimately you may or may not have a security, um, you're, you're just asking people to make a judgment call. And the regulator, if the regulator weighs those factors in one way and, and the regulated party weighs it in a different way, We'll just come up with a different conclusion, and and so I, I, I said in my testimony that that the the SEC's test is not does not produce or does not lead to reproducible results. I have to be able to look at the facts and come to the same conclusion about whether an asset is a security as the regulator will do. And you know, it's not helped by the fact that the one digital asset the the SEC seems to be pretty clear is not a security, which is which is Bitcoin. The SEC has frankly never showed us how they weighed those fifty factors. On, on Bitcoin alone, so we end up uh, uh, stabbing in the dark and not, not surprisingly coming to conclusions that the regulator may disagree with. Very good. Looks like it's time for Congress to get our act together to help uh, with some of these clarities. Uh, thank you very much. With that, I would, uh, well, before we recognize the ranking member, the uh, order is uh, Mr. Thompson will go after Ms. Caraveo, and then Mr. Davis, you are on deck thereafter. The ranking member is recognized. Thank you again, Mr. Chair, and thank you to the panel um, for your testimony. Colorado actually just recently became the first state where residents have the opportunity to pay their taxes in cryptocurrency. So I especially appreciate the opportunity to discuss uh, digital assets because as more and more Americans invest, it is important, as I said earlier, that we rec recognize these regulatory gaps so that we continue to spur innovation, but also protect uh, customers. So Mr. Massad, under your leadership, the CFTC began this conversation regarding virtual currencies and potential F, uh, CFTC oversight as early as 2014. And the agency determined that virtual currencies can be commodities and began to take enforcement actions. Uh, could you discuss the process through which those initial determinations were made by the commission and the resources that were necessary to support that work? Certainly. Thank you for the question. Uh, the definition of commodity obviously doesn't contemplate uh, digital assets. But it does refer to uh, language that was included several decades ago that said all services, rights, and interests in which contracts for future delivery are presently or in the future dealt in. Market participants were coming into my office saying, we're thinking about doing a Bitcoin swap or a Bitcoin future. What do you think? And we thought about it and we said, we think that means they're commodities because they were talking about contracts for future delivery. Um, so that is the action we took uh, in a settlement first with an entity called CoinFlip and then in another one with Terra Exchange, and that was then built on. Uh, but it's important then to keep that, uh, I think, concept in mind that it was because market participants were contemplating or engaging in uh, uh, derivatives on those commodities. Now, there are arguments that it should even be inter interpreted more broadly. Um, but that's where we started. 
As far as the um, <clears throat> resources question, you know, at that time, uh, that was a fairly small part of our activity. But now the market, you know, is huge. And the, neither agency, I think, really has the resources it needs uh, to police this market, given that what we've seen, from, particularly from the recent failures, is evidence of you know, failure to protect customer assets, fraud and manipulation, conflicts of interest, lack of governance, and so forth. You really are leading directly into my second question, is what is the potential effect of Congress passing, passing legislation to address those gaps, but not providing additional funding or resources? Well, I think that would be a real mistake. Now, I, uh, you know, you're going to have to give the agencies funding if you expect them to really police this market. Now, I have noted that if you create an SRO, that could impose a lot of the burden of the cost on the industry, just the way we do with all our SROs. Um, but clearly, you know, this is a huge market, and it will require uh, additional resources. Great. Um, in the last year, the CFTC has brought a number of major enforcement actions against major players in the digital asset industry, including FTX, um, and recent actions taken against Binance. Uh, while we are here today discussing regulatory gaps, many of these enforcement actions really seem to be the result of fraud or misrepresentation. For example, um, in the months following the FTX collapse, uh, many suggestions were made by commissioners and stakeholders on how to prevent similar future collapses. So for anyone in the panel, in addition to providing authority to regulate spot digital commodity markets, what other authorities or disclosures should we consider providing for the CFTC? And that's open to anyone. Well, you know, again, as, as I've said, what I'd like to see is a way to provide authority and resources to raise the level of investor protection without rewriting the law just yet. We may want to create new definitions. There are lots of them, you know, that have been proposed in various uh, proposals of Congress, in including uh, the chairman's and others. Uh, and those, you know, uh, have a lot to be said for them. But they are all different if you look at them. And the danger is I think we don't have enough information even about the tokens. We don't have a disclosure regime for the tokens to know whether, in fact, there are uh, there's an enterprise with people involved who are doing things to enhance the value of that token, which is the basis for whether it's a security. So I don't know how anyone can say that's not a security when you don't even have the information about the token. So again, my proposal is let's elevate investor protection first, let's get a little more disclosure, and then come back and revisit how we should define uh, this. Thank you, with that I yield back my time. Ladies and gentlemen, the legend of Howard, Pennsylvania, the chairman of the full committee, Mr. G.T. Thompson. That was a good walk on. Couldn't you put some music to that too? That'd be even better. You know, the Howard, Pennsylvania, 600 people, one red light. Uh, <laughs> hey, uh, uh, good afternoon, everybody. I, uh, uh, and uh, thank you to all the witnesses that are here today for lending your expertise to this incredibly important hearing and thank you to the chairman and ranking member for your leadership and your commitment and your passion in this area and, and to all the folks all of our members are serving on this this sub subcommittee there was a great demand to serve on this subcommittee this congress in no small part because of the opportunity to work on digital asset issues critical issue going forward and i'm excited about the work of the subcommittee i want to thank thank you all for your willingness to serve on this subcommittee uh, I think that there's a great potential for digital assets to provide significant value for the American, the American public. Web 3.0, not just in monetary terms, but also as tools to solve real world problems as, as uh, have been reflected on that today. Uh, but as uh, you know, as also, uh, you know, digital asset developers, users, institutions need clear, thoughtful rules of the road to create these solutions. Uh, as Chairman Johnson said, we're working hand in glove with the House Financial Services Committee to craft legislation uh, that will do just that. Uh, this is perhaps unusual for Congress, but it's the right thing to do to make good public policy. Uh, no one can solve this issue alone. It, it will take the cooperation of committees and regulators to build a workable framework to oversee digital assets. Um, and uh, so thankful for all of the witnesses who are sharing their expertise. Um, 
uh, uh, start my question with Mrs. Rubin. I'd, I, I'd like to further explore with you the practical uses of digital assets and blockchain technology. In your testimony, you talk about how several organizations are using the uh, uh, Hedera network to improve their businesses. Uh, can you elaborate on a project or two uh, uh, who utilize uh, your network to accomplish daily or commercial activities? Thank you, Chairman, for this question. Um, there, I included a few use cases in the in the testimony. One was was Dovu, which allows farmers to tokenize the work that they're doing. So, let's say they have a regular crop and they plant additional flowers around the edge that has different uh, environmental benefits and carbon benefits. They can tokenize that and sell it as an offset. They can, um, if they decide to drill instead of tilling, they can tokenize that changed farming technique and make money on it. It's, um, it's really fascinating. Another one um, that, that I thought was fun was True FM, uh, Tune FM. And it's kind of like Spotify, but on the blockchain. So it allows artists to get paid immediately. Like as soon as someone's listening to it, then that, that tiny amount of money goes to them. They don't have to like wait. They don't have to prove there's a certain number of listeners. It's, it's clearly on the blockchain. This number of people listen to your song, and this is how much you get and per amount of time that the song was played. Um, another um, that really moved me was with AVC Global and Medical Value Chain. And what it does is it allows, it uses Hedera to authenticate pharmaceuticals. So you can track and make sure that that pharmaceutical is legitimate. It turns out that car, uh, counterfeit pharmaceuticals, um, it doesn't just cost companies money when they're used. It, it like endangers people's lives because these pharmaceuticals are, are not real. So um, there's, there's just amazing use cases that, that we, haven't, we haven't even begun to explore. Well, thank you for that. Uh, Ms. Manny, our, as you know, there has been much debate in the U.S. on whether digital assets are considered commodities or securities. We heard that discussion today. Some federal regulations have claimed that all digital assets except Bitcoin are securities. If all digital assets were deemed securities tomorrow, how would that affect the customers of Falcon X? Thank you for your question, Mr. Chairman. It would certainly mean that our customers would be disrupted. Um, they would have an asset that they're holding that they would have no clear avenue to be able to transfer, which really gets at what the heart of the technology is for, which is the ease of transfer and being able to control the terms on which you do it in a disintermediated fashion. It, it would be extremely disruptive to their businesses. Yeah. Well, thank you to each of you for your expertise, your testimony, your oral and your written testimony. Much appreciated. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. We'll have Davis, Langworthy, uh, Budzinski. Mr. Davis, you're recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Chair, and to our ranking member. And thank you to the witnesses who are here. It's always good to see. I think I would have concurred with the music was absent. With, yeah, we need that. <laughs> <laughs> but I would, to all the witnesses, again, thank you for joining us today. Uh, most people in my district in eastern North Carolina very likely never heard, I would imagine, of this CFTC or the SEC. I'm just keeping it real today. Um, <laughs> most Americans probably haven't either, um, but more and more Americans have heard of cryptocurrencies and have either purchased them themselves or have raised concerns about how they will affect the traditional economic markets. Um, so my question is, what would you t tell people in my district why the um, CFTC or the SEC matters to them or how these agencies um, would impact them on a day-to-day -day basis? Um, thank you for the question, Congressman. It's estimated that about 17% of Americans have purchased uh, cryptocurrency. A lot of those, uh, I think, and that's also scaled toward younger generations, and it's, and it's scaled somewhat toward lower income people. And a lot of those people have suffered uh, significant losses. A lot of them bought after prices had gone up quite a bit, and then prices fell dramatically, and we had uh, failures of some big firms. 
A lot of them lost retirement savings, college savings, other assets very important to them. Having a regulatory framework is no guarantee against failure, but it can certainly help prevent it. And particularly because the types of things that have come out as to what the failed institutions did in terms of using customer assets improperly, uh, using them through affiliates that had conflicts of interest, uh, failures to prevent fraud and manipulation, I think those are the kinds of things that a good regulatory framework uh, can prevent. Uh, my own view is we shouldn't be basing policy on a judgment about the merits of cryptocurrencies. There's, they're obviously out there and people are investing. But we do need to set up a framework that uh, gives people some assurance that there's integrity and transparency and protection of customer assets. There's been more and more talk about officials and those in the public about a central bank digital currency in the U.S. Can you speak then on if you have heard from the federal government pursuing this policy? And if so, what would that mean for, again, the average consumer and how they conduct business? Well, um, I think the Federal Reserve is engaged in research on a CBDC, but I think that is years away at best five, ten years away if we decide to have one. It's not clear that we need one. There are a lot of policy issues both ways. Cryptocurrencies are here today, uh, and there are stable coins, which effectively the value of those are tied to the dollar, and those could be significant in payments, but again, we lack a regulatory framework uh, for those as well. So my own view is we need to create the proper regulatory frameworks for the unbacked crypto tokens, as well as a proper regulatory framework for stable coins. We need to be pursuing research on CBDCs and how to improve our payment systems, but I see those things as happening on a longer track. Yeah. Well, I would just end today by saying um, I've heard so much from um, residents back home, um, and at the same time, there appears to be so much uh, of an opportunity here to educate the public, common everyday people on, on this whole topic and why we're here. And I can't say enough when I think about fraud, um, scams that are taking place, the complexity of this, I can't say enough to our leadership, to our ranking member and, and above to our chair for having us here today and also for the finance, financial services. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Davis. Uh, the lineup is Mr. Langworthy, uh, Ms. Budzinski, and then uh, Mr. Rouser, unless somebody else comes back in. Mr. Langworthy from New York, you are recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Ranking Member. Uh, Mrs., uh, uh, Mrs. Rubin, last week the European Parliament passed their crypto asset legislative framework known as MECA. Uh, I heard from several crypto companies that due to the lack of regulatory clarity, uh, that many firms are choosing to domicile their companies in jurisdictions that do have clarity. Uh, in addition, a recent study published uh, by the Developer Report reported that the U.S. is continuing to lose its lead in blockchain, going from 40% of the developers globally to 29%. Uh, Mrs. Rubin, are you seeing this innovation flight as well? As if, if you are seeing that, how can we reverse that? Um, thank you, um, Mr. Langworthy, for that question. Um, yes, the flight that you're discussing is real, and it's happening. People are, are fleeing to jurisdictions with regulatory clarity because they want to know that their businesses are operating within the law and that they can operate fully and that they can make investments that will stand. So they're... Um, it's, it's kind of this shocking situation where the United States, which is usually at the forefront of every technology, is now standing back and allowing other jurisdictions to, to run ahead. And this is not just bad for the businesses themselves, but it's bad, bad for the American consumers because we won't have access to these, these transformative technologies. Um, you know, Hedera was created by US veterans. It, um, people who were teaching at the Air Force Academy. Like, we launched Hedera here in the United States as a global platform. Um, we're, our firm desire is to make this um, 
uh, be a platform from here. But it is, it is very scary and fearful to um, be working in a, an environment without regulatory clarity. So the number one thing that you could do is help provide that regulatory clarity. Thank you very much. And um, uh, Mrs. Manny, are pivoting here to China. Uh, we know that adversaries like China and Russia, they're exploring ways to undermine the U.S. dollar and our position as the world leader in finance. Uh, as you know, markets have thrived under U.S. leadership as our values of, uh, of economic freedom, capital formation, and consumer protection. They have shaped the global economy. Uh, many are calling crypto the next wave of financial innovation. So what are the risks if the U.S. stands idly by while our adversaries take the lead in this area in the future of finance? Thank you, Congressman, for your question. Uh, I certainly agree. I think it is incredibly important that we remain uh, relevant and a leader in developing what this technology looks like. If the technology is developed offshore, and we're not going to see U.S. market participants not being interested in engaging in the technology, but they're going to receive what's developed overseas. And the U.S. has always been a leader in technology and financial markets, as you pointed out. And we really look to see that we continue to, to do that for this asset class as well. Okay. Would any of the other panelists wish to weigh in on that question? Um, sure. I think it is very important for the U.S. to be focused on the technology of payments generally. I think we're still a ways away from the dollar really being threatened. The dollar's dominance is related, as you know, to a number of factors, the strength of our economy, the rule of law, the stability of our government. But I think the technology of payments is important. And, you know, it is possible that countries could move away from using the dollar as a payment mechanism, even if they continue to invest in our, our treasury securities. So that's why I've supported you know, research, not just on CBDCs, but improving payments in other ways, a stablecoin framework, and so forth. Thank you very much. And I yield back, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> Thank you very much. We will go uh, Budzinski, and then uh, Nunn. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, Rose, Mr. Rose, and then uh, we will go uh, Ms. Salinas. All right, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Ranking Member. Um, and thank you to the panelists. I really appreciate your expertise and your testimony um, as it relates to this topic. I share a lot of the sentiment that Congressman Davis just shared with you as it relates to his district and kind of from the consumer end user perspective and constituents that might not all be as up to speed on the financial um, services sector and all the ins and outs of cryptocurrency. And so, as I think all, you know, everyone is looking for new opportunities to take advantage of making a little bit more money, but we want to make sure that consumers are also obviously protected. Just to kind of piggyback a little bit on what Congressman Davis was asking is, could you give some ideas of like maybe some better communication that we might be able to have with consumers around the risks that they are maybe taking on in this new um, industry, but that you know, I think settling some of that risk and getting people more comfortable with it also could have them make more calculated um, decisions that fin uh, financially could benefit them. I think communication is really key and something that we haven't really been able to tackle in a, in a good way. So I'm just curious what you might think about that. Well, sure, I'd be happy to address that. I mean, I think one of the challenges is that I think even with people who have gotten into this space investing, they may be aware that the crypto assets themselves have risk because they're volatile. Mm -hmm. But what they don't appreciate sometimes is these trading platforms have a lot of risk because they're unregulated. And that's exemplified by, again, the studies that show how much wash trading there are, where basically someone is trading with themselves to inflate the price or inflate the volume. And there are big, there are holders of Bitcoin, the, the, the so-called whales, people who hold a lot of Bitcoin who potentially can easily um, 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 manipulate that price. The same is true with protection of customer assets. They don't realize that their customer assets are not protected in the same way that they are if you buy uh, a share of stock or if you deposit money in a bank. Uh, there's not there's no insurance scheme, of course, and there's not even what we have for securities where we at least have uh, a regime uh, on brokers or even in commodity futures, we have better protections in bankruptcy. There's no protections in bankruptcy 
for uh, consumers. So, you know, I think if we had a stronger regulatory regime, part of that would also be uh, an education campaign so people are aware of these risks. That's a great idea. Any other thoughts? I'm most familiar with the CFTC, but there are, there are robust um, consumer protection mechanisms under, you know, CFTC rules and regulations. And, you know, CFTC does cover, you know, a significant retail base. You know, there are retail foreign, uh, uh, foreign exchange transactions that are subject to CFTC, and there's also leveraged retail commodity transactions. So if I buy Bitcoin and I want to, you know, uh, leverage up and buy, you know, five times or six times or seven times Bitcoin, that is a product that is currently regulated by the CFTC. And so, you know, uh, that agency has already been wrestling with that question about, okay, we know we're dealing with retail. We know it's a product that, you know, has, has some differences than other products they may be dealing with. How do we give proper disclosures? What types of requirements do we give to, to the exchanges or the people who operate in this space so we, we limit or, or avoid wash trading? And I think one of the benefits of, you know, a CFTC style of, of, of regulation is that the exchange itself ha obtains responsibilities for implementing core principles and having a, a, an effective rule, bake, a rule book that is reviewed by the CFTC and agreed upon by the CFTC that they have to follow and impose and enforce. And that can include those types of um, provisions, you know, uh, customer disclosures that are common sense that can be understood by the, by the regular retail investor, uh, understanding of the risk that you take, you know, th this wash trading problem that uh, uh, the former chairman has talked about. I mean, the CFTC has brought enforcement actions uh, against wash trading and some of the biggest um, digital assets out there. So I think a lot of the ingredients are there mm -hmm. uh, to be able to give, you know, your retail investor the type of information and protection um, and, you know, information so they can make an, an informed choice. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I'll ask one really quick question, too, and we, your, your testimony has touched on a lot of this, but if we could just kind of go back to, um, you know, a new regulatory framework for digital assets. If you could just top line go through for me really quick, what the guiding principles do you believe should be at the core of any regulation? I know you've talked talked about this a little bit, but if we could review it again one more time. Sure, I think um, they're very similar to the principles we have in our securities and derivatives markets today. The protection of customer assets, systems to prevent fraud and manipulation, uh, governance measures, including fitness of directors, regular reporting, uh, re both publicly, uh, pre and post trade transparency, as well as reporting uh, to regulators. Uh, risk management, cybersecurity, and that's a big one because, you know, there could be a hack of a, of a platform that has consequential collateral damage to other parts of our financial system. And also just making sure they do a good job on know your customer and, and money laundering because that's important from, for preventing illicit activity. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yield back. Uh, let's go to Mr. Rose and then uh, Ms. Salinas. Thank you, Chairman Johnson and member, uh, Ranking Member Caraveo for, uh, pardon me, uh, for holding this hearing. And thank you to our witnesses for being with us today and taking time. Um, Mr. Massett, given the uncertainty created by the regulators, I think it's important that Congress helps clarify the line between digital assets that are commodities and those that are securities. However, it seems there is a third bucket of digital assets, like digital collectibles, so-called non-fungible tokens, I guess we might say, uh, or digital sports cards that are unique and not like traditional CFTC-regulated commodity products. How would you suggest Congress approach this group of digital, digital assets? Uh, it's an excellent question, Congressman. Um, I have focused on the fungible uh, tokens. Um, as have many of the pieces of legislation. You're right that there are issues on the non-fungible tokens, uh, too. Um, I would consider those separately. Um, you could consider having uh, the, the um, uh, CFPB uh, issue rules on that because, you know, they don't, they don't create um, quite the same issues that we have uh, with kind of the securities commodities world. Um, but I think it's important that we do create a framework, and, and generally those are, those are sort of traded on different platforms. They're not, you know, the, the coin bases of the world so much. They are, they are other platforms. So 
that would be my view, but I agree with you that that's an area that needs examination also. Thank you. An article published in Forbes late last year and written by George Calhoun, who is the Quantitative Finance Program Director at the Stevens Institute of Technology, noted that according to a report by the European Union Institute for Security Studies, the Chinese government has leveraged the traceability and immutability offered by blockchain technology in the field of policing, has explored the use of blockchain for the dissemination of propaganda, and is already using blockchain to gather evidence against dissidents. As Congress considers clarifying the regulatory scope of the SEC and CFTC's jurisdictions over digital assets, I would like to ask each of you if you feel that Congress should use this opportunity to consider guardrails to ensure that bad actors like the Chinese Communist Party can't utilize digital assets that are developed and or supported in the United States to assist in repression of their citizens. And I'll let any of you that would like to comment. I'll just say I think everyone recognizes that privacy is something that, that we all value, uh, that it's important to us, it's part of our, it's part of our culture. Uh, and it's that certainly when, you, when I think in, in, in terms of CFTC regulation and the way that the CFTC regulates, you think about core principles, right? So you can imagine a world where one of the core principles uh, an exchange or, or a regulated entity has to wrestle with and figure out how to implement is how to have proper privacy protections for the way it operates and the way the digital assets that trade under it operate. And so I think it's, I think it's an important concept and I think it's one that uh, you know, we are perfectly capable of looking into and figuring out and make sure that we are properly factoring into the way that this industry continues to develop. I'd say certainly. I would reference back to my earlier point, too, about the fact that it's, this is why it's crucial for the U.S. to be leading on the development of this technology so that we can set the standards for what it should look like. I would agree, yes. We absolutely need to take this opportunity to put up guardrails against repression. And I would add only that the U.S. leadership vacuum gives China an opportunity for influence, and we need to fill it. And I would just add that I think that's another reason why it's important for us to be a leader in regulation, uh, not just obviously of cryptocurrencies, but of things like stable coins and looking into a CBDC. Not that we should decide to have one. We may not need one, but we need to be at the table as these, some of these issues are talked about so that we make sure payment systems develop in ways that are consistent with Western values, protection of privacy. And, and I would just add that the, the lack of a clear regulatory framework at the moment means that we don't have the kind of corporate and institutional investment in this sector that would allow our country and entrepreneurs and, and, and brilliant people in our country to, to be developing and exploring the kinds of use cases that, frankly, other governments, including repressive governments, you know, are, are doing right now. So I think you know, it, it's, we're hamstringing ourselves by not providing clear rules of the road for, for American businesses to try to, to, to solve you know, problems. Thank you. I see my time's expired. I yield back, Chairman Jones. Ms. Salinas will be recognized for five minutes. And next up on deck uh, would be uh, Mr. Rouser. Thank you, Chairman Johnson and uh, Ranking Member Caraveo for this really important discussion today. As the country grapples with questions on how to regulate cryptocurrency and what role it plays in our financial markets or otherwise, the states have really had to step up in the interim to try to protect consumers and identify some paths forward. My own state of Oregon was the first state to give control of dig digital assets to a fiduciary. And currently, Oregon law requires companies that transfer digital currency from one person to another to be licensed as money transmitters. However, Oregon law does not have any requirement on companies that only take cash and turn it into digital currency. And this is for anyone on the panel who wishes to respond. From your individual perspectives, does licensing money transmitters help protect consumers? And what are the shortfalls in doing so? <clears throat> Certainly, the money transmitter laws are, do help protect consumers. But I think for this sector, for this industry, they are simply woefully inadequate as a regulatory framework. Uh, they basically impose very minimal net worth requirements, very minimal security, like post-bond requirements, and some of them have permitted investment requirements. 
they don't create the kind of framework that we need uh, to regulate this sector and, and protect the public. It's kind of like, you know, if you imagine that after the 1929 crash, Roosevelt had said, you know what, I think the states can take care of this. We don't need a securities law. Um, the blue sky laws we had would not have been adequate. So the same is true here. Now, some states have tried to build on that, and that's great. I encourage that, that kind of activity. Um, and one of the things that should be done at the state level is to clarify essentially property rights and transfers of digital assets, the, the uniform commercial code issues, and some states are working on that. That is extremely important for uh, states to take up. Thank you. Does anyone else wish to respond? All right, I'll move on. So, um, Mr. Massad, during your tenure as chair of the CFTC, um, were there instances in which the CFTC worked with the SEC to actually resolve regulatory disagreements? And what were the results in those instances? And would it be helpful to establish a clearer process by which federal agencies regulating digital assets could actually work in tandem? Uh, yes, we did. Uh, Mary Jo White was the chair then, and we worked very closely together on the implementation of the Dodd-Frank requirements for over-the-counter swaps, and that was critical uh, because both agencies did have responsibilities. And that type of cooperation dates back to the founding of the SEC. Uh, the Shad Johnson Accord uh, was one of the main examples. It doesn't come easily sometimes. Um, it does depend sometimes on people's personalities and the time and so forth. But, you know, I think if Congress sets an expectation uh, that, that they expect the agencies to do that, um, that it can happen. And it's, clearly it's needed in this space. Thank you. Mr. Davis, despite their limited authorities, the CFTC has brought at least 70 enforcement actions involving digital asset commodities, as you note in your testimony. Are there some common themes within those enforcement actions? Uh, I mean, I remember one person telling me, you know, it doesn't matter the, the, the asset class, you know, fraud and, and schemes to get people to separate it from their money are always the same. Right. Right, and so you have the same types of fraudulent schemes that you get with other asset classes. You have a classic, you know, pump and dump scheme, right? You tout, you tout the, the benefits of a particular cryptocurrency. You didn't tell people that you own it. Uh, you pump up the price and then you sell out from underneath it. Uh, as the former chairman has, has referred to, wash sales uh, is, is active in, uh, in a host of markets uh, where you try to, you know, you, you're you're acting on both sides of the ledger to beef up the, what appears to be the activity in a particular asset, right? And so the, the types of activities um, that are fraudulent um, aren't unique to digital assets, right? But they are also occurring in the digital asset market. And to the CFTC's credit, you know, during my tenure there, there was an active engagement to learn more about how the digital asset space operated, how those markets work, what types of, how, how fraudsters were taking the tools that they'd use elsewhere and how they were applying it to digital assets. And so I think the CFTC has really done uh, a, an excellent job through its enforcement actions and, and other activities that it's doing to really get a better understanding of how these underlying digital asset markets work. Um, because it's very important for them with the role that they have with futures and derivatives to understand how those spot markets work. Thank you all for your time today, I yield back. Mr. Rouser is recognized for five minutes, and he will be followed thereafter by Mr. Jackson. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate our panelists uh, being here today. Uh, this is an incredibly important uh, topic. You know, my experience is Congress either overprescribes or underprescribes. It's kind of hard to, hard to get it right. So my uh, question to each of you, I'll give you an opportunity uh, to share uh, uh, with the subcommittee uh, what does overregulation look like? What are you worried that we're going to do? Uh, I always like to know what not to do first. That way, it helps me helps get me on the right path. You know, whoever wants to start, or I'm happy to answer that. Um, I'm actually worried that you will try too hard to uh, clarify this issue about what's a security, what's a commodity. Um, I. I respect the intent, I respect the desire to do so, but when you look at the legislation out there, there's been several proposals made, they all do it differently, they all, I think, 
will provoke a lot of questions. I can find problems and loopholes in each one of them. I think any of those things are going to lead to a lot of questions of interpretation, potential litigation. I just don't think we know enough. In part, it's because we don't have enough disclosure about these tokens, and that's why I'm, I'm kind of suggesting something incremental. Require the two agencies to set some standards for the platforms that elevate investor protection, that provide a little more disclosure, and then come back and look at how should we really define this permanently. That's the essence of what I'm suggesting. I, I, I would be concerned um, about that approach. I, I understand uh, some of the practical reasons um, why former Chairman Massad would, uh, is, is proposing it, but I would be concerned about an approach where Congress simply acted on Bitcoin and Ether and, and didn't address the other 23,000 assets that are out there. Um, and, I, and I, do, I, I don't think that there's a way for Congress, frankly, to avoid this very difficult question of drawing the line between securities and commodities. Um, because the, agents, the, the, the agencies are at loggerheads right now, and, and the SEC, I believe, is at loggerheads with, with the industry right now um, about what these things are. And so from my perspective, as, as somebody who advises a lot of different clients in the industry, I think we do need Congress to come in and give us some, some basic line drawing, some basic boxes that we can put these different assets in. Now, I don't think all digital assets are the same. I think that they're, they're, there's, there's, uh, uh, you know, they're endlessly mutable, um, but I think that there are some, some basic categories that we, we could begin to work with. Um, I've read a lot of, the, uh, of, of the, the legislation and the drafts that have been out there so far. I'm not entirely sure that any of them kind of gets this question just right yet. But I, I think that hard work does need to be done by Congress. And, and I, I unfortunately don't have um, a, a lot of confidence that if, it, if it's left to the regulators to sort out amongst themselves, that we will be in any different situation from the situation that we're in today, which I don't believe is tenable for the industry. Can I just clarify? I'm not suggesting that we act only on Bitcoin or Ether. What I was suggesting was that Congress pass a law which mandates that any platform trading Bitcoin or Ether be subject to these principles. But that would be for everything it trades. That's just a definitional way of defining which platforms you want. There is no platform out there of any relevance that's not trading Bitcoin or Ether. They're 70% of the market. And often trading is in pairs. So you're gonna capture the whole market and you're gonna set standards that then apply to all of the tokens. The fact is 23,000 are not listed. If you take the four largest exchanges, they list a total of about 400. And what's quite interesting actually is they don't list the same securities. So if it's so clear to them, or the same tokens I should say, if it's so clear to them that they're only listing commodities, why are they all different? I got 42 <laughs> seconds real quick. I'd briefly add that one thing that Congress could do wrong is to think about regulating the technology. Instead, think about regulating the activity. And that's what we're seeing in other jurisdictions around the world. Yes, ma'am. I would just add that, you know, this is a very entrepreneurial space. So I'd like to see principles-based regulation that allows that innovation to continue to grow. And I would say don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. Um, adding better guardrails about the line between securities and commodities will greatly enhance the ability of us to give advice and for businesses to know what to do. You are incredible. Five seconds left. Amazing. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. And there's a lot of good stuff there uh, at the end. Really, really good stuff. All right, we'll go Mr. Jackson, and that will be followed by Mr. Nunn. Uh, Mr. Jackson, you are recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. Thank you for your participation today. I think to follow up on my colleague's question on uh, defining this as the commodity versus the stock. I'm very familiar with it, uh, but in simple layman's terms, for those that are watching us, stock is a piece of ownership in the actual corporation, and this commodity can be an asset before it has actually been uh, delivered, evolved, or even planted. So in your honest and humble opinion, shall I say, uh, what would you like to see it described as? I do not believe the regulators know your business better than you. And I am concerned that we're behind the ball as to we can see an implosion. We saw something with a hard asset stock, if you will, in the SVB that um, 
where the assets and the balance sheet is swollen, then contracted from macroeconomic circumstances beyond their control, raising of the interest rates. They couldn't rein it in. And I take it most of you up there are old enough like me to know of long-term capital and other things. So where is this? Is it, an, is it a stock as an asset or is it a commodity or an asset to be realized in the future that's in its creation? And that's open to the panel. Now, I'll go to my testimony. Um, you know, if you look at what the commissions themselves have said, right, not a chairman, not a commissioner, if you look at what the CFTC as a commission have said and what the SEC as a commission have said, uh, the CFTC has identified seven of the top traded digital assets as securities, and that is 76% of the market. The Securities and Exchange Commission has identified one of the top 15 digital assets as a security, and that's 2% of the market, right? And so you can look at those, you know, seven that the CFTC have identified through enforcement actions, and you can see some characteristics about them. They tend to be decentralized. People tend to use them for, for consumptive purpose and not for an investment purpose. So there, there are some characteristics there. And so, you know, I, I, I agree that, you know, each, each digital asset is, is a bit different. Uh, but certainly the, so the actions at the commission level with the most heavily traded digital assets as at least giving us some additional clarity. There can always be more. There definitely needs to be more. But they have given us some level of clarity about where some of the lines might be uh, between security and commodity. And the other thing that I would note is that over time, one would expect that a digital asset becomes more of a commodity than a security. Because in theory, with most digital assets, the idea it's going to be um, you know, widely accepted, widely used, widely dispersed. Those are much more the characteristics of a commodity than a security. And Mr. Jackson, I think you put your finger right on it. Um, a, an asset that represents a claim on the assets or revenues or properties of, of, a, of, a, of a business or a business enterprise, that is a security. And, and even if it's issued on a blockchain, it should be regulated like a security. Um, I, I think, and, and so if I were going to draw lines about and, and, and you know, create boxes for these things, I would put those in, in, in a category by themselves. But then I would go to the things like Mr. Davis is talking about and say, okay, um, this, is, this particular asset is, is, you know, doesn't represent a claim on a business or a promise from a business. This is an asset that I can use to send a payment or an asset that I can use to purchase, you know, file storage space or something like that. I do believe that, 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 that users need good information about it, and this goes back to one of the questions that, um, you know, that came earlier about you know, why should a retail person, why should a, an ordinary person um, uh, uh, you know, trading these things, why should they have that information? I think it is different from, from a commodity. Um, you know, people have an, uh, 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 an intuitive idea about what an orange is, but they're not necessarily going to have an intuitive idea about what a digital asset is. So I do think we should have, um, standards and, and, and information that needs to be provided and back that up with, with, with liability for the person providing that information. And, and that's where a digital asset is just different from what we customarily think of as a security, what we customarily think of as a commodity. And again, the reason why I think Congress needs to come in and begin to draw these lines and begin to say how, how we want these assets to be regulated rather than this tired debate over whether it's a commodity or a security. And let me ask just one follow-up on that, and please take it, is the, uh, it's an opaque industry. So at what point do you declare this asset, this commodity, to be decentralized? Well, I, I wouldn't... I wouldn't have decentralization as, as being all that important because I think whether, whether the asset is decentralized or not, consumers still need the information about it. And I also think that we, we still want to have strong market oversight and market regulation. So I, wouldn't, I personally would not focus on decentralization because I think we need to be able to cover centralized assets as well. The, the decentralized point also goes to the fact that we don't have enough information about a lot of these tokens. You, we don't even know sometimes, is there a foundation behind it? Are there people with administrative keys? And that's why, again, I'm pushing for more information, more disclosure, more consumer protection first, and then come back and define exactly where the lines are drawn, because we are talking about thousands and thousands of digital assets. I thank you, and I yield my time back, Mr. Johnson. Thank Very good. Thank you, Mr. Jackson. We will go to the gentleman from Iowa, Mr. Nunn. You are recognized for five minutes. Thereafter, we will go to uh, Mr. Molinaro. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I want to compliment both the chairs of the digital asset on the financial services side as well as the Ag Committee for working so well on this, both bipartisan, bicameral, and we're going to get into, for those folks at home uh, playing the government bingo card on acronyms here, an SEC and a CFTC. Now, under the SEC, we're talking about all things that are securities. Under the CFTC, we're talking about all things that would be commodities. In my home state of Iowa, we know commodities very well. But we do hear from uh, Chair Gensler on the uh, Financial Services Committee that all tokens are securities. And we heard here in the Ag Committee not only a month ago from the FCC Chairman Benham, who said pretty much the opposite, that all commodities are where they should be. So if we can, I do think, Mr. Hall, with respect, it is important that we provide some guidance for those who are in this space. Mr. Massad, you are former CFTC Chairman. Simple question, right? Ethereum. Commodity, security. I don't have enough information. I think the concern about Ether, Ethereum, was in the merge where they changed the system of validating transactions. There seemed to be a, a foundation, a group of people involved in that. Is that under the Howey test, a common enterprise from which if I hold a, a Ethereum, I'm expecting to receive a return? I don't know. And that's the problem with all these. I don't have enough information. And I think that there's a lot of Americans who are in the same situation. What's the challenge of having these conflicting, you know, messages out there coming from both the CFTC and the SEC on it, this? It confuses people, obviously. And I think, obviously, we're, we're in a stalemate where we're not improving investor protection because of it. Right. And... The risk is if we try to rewrite it without having enough information, not only could we get it wrong, but there could be unintended consequences in our broader markets. That's why, again, I'm not against coming up with a new definition. I'm just saying take a little more time. Well, we let, me, let me push back on that just a moment. Sure. I think Ms. Rubin actually had a very good argument here uh, from Herida, which is an Air Force guy, Air Force creation, compliments, by the way. Industries do want clarity in the law. And I'm going to go to Ms. Monier on this. We've seen the last few days a couple of other countries and other regions have moved out in this space. The European Union has moved forward with the markets and crypto asset, kind of a space in between the FCT uh, and SEC called MICA. The United Kingdom is finalizing its own digital asset regulatory proposal. What I think was highlighted here is we don't necessarily want to regulate the commodity. We want to provide the framework, right? So... Could you speak to us from Falcon X's perspective where you guys are seeing innovation thrive when there's a structure and where innovation is being stymied because there is no structure? Absolutely. Thank you for your question. Certainty in any industry gives the ability for those who want to get involved, who want to build, who want to grow, who want to create businesses to do so, right? And having no certainty makes it very hard to do. When you employ people, you can't employ people with the assumption that your company might be here today but may not be here tomorrow. You have an obligation to those employees. That certainty is necessary in the U.S. right now, and we're seeing that the jurisdictions where there is certainty, and I want to make clear where there's certainty, not lack of regulation, is, is getting the benefit of those companies being founded there. You are the first and only, if I have this correct, CFTC registered cryptocurrency focus where you are a swap dealer, um, which is a great thing. How does the CFTC as a principle-based regulator in comparison to the SEC in this form of regulation? Do they have it right? <laughs> yeah, we've had a very robust and effective dialogue with the CFTC. It's, it's nuanced. They've been very interested in learning about our space and understanding our business. Um, they're certainly not an easy regulator, and, and that's okay. That's not what we're looking. No, nobody in the industry is looking for that, right? So they they've been um, very uh, eager to learn about our business, eager to learn about the space, eager to understand how the existing framework that they have is one that we've been able to comply with, um, and that that's made it incredibly. Um, easy for us to be able to build in that space because of that certainty. So let's go back to our bingo card. On the SEC and the FTC, uh, you know, let's take this away from the unelected bureaucrats and put it squarely in the court where I've got, you know, a, three quarters of a million bosses back home. What can we be doing in Congress to make this space better framed for you, businesses like yours? Certainty. Create, you know, taking congressional action to create some certainty in this space so that we can keep doing this here in the U.S. I'm going to push you one deeper. What does certainty look like to you? It, to me, it looks like uh, a system where there's rules of the road 
there is a framework that you know that you can operate in, that you know will be the same tomorrow, and so that you can invest in this space and build a company in this space. Nothing worse than DC whiplash, I get it. Yeah. Copy. Chairman, thank you very much. I yield back my time. As much as it may pain me to say it, I think Mr. Nunn hit it out of the park with his uh, description of the need to close the gap here. Well said. Uh, <laughs> Mr. Mueller. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Mr. Mueller Naro, you are recognized. Is, is that now the standard, Mr. Chairman? Are you going to grade our uh, lines? Yeah, yeah sure. Yeah. Part, yeah. You are either better than none or not quite as good as none. <laughs> well, well, bingo. Uh, <laughs> Uh, Mr. Chairman, thank you. Uh, I, I, I'm excited to be in Congress in this moment in time, and, and, and I've said this many times. I just I represent a rural part of, of upstate New York. Um, uh, digital assets uh, provide, the, I think, one of the greatest opportunities to harness innovation, but also to provide access um, uh, to capital in places to, and to people where the traditional banking institutions, frankly, you know, I, I don't want to say fail them, but, but are outside of their reach at times. Um, and, and so, interestingly enough, right, uh, this is an entire industry that is seeking to be regulated to a degree. What are the, the golden question for us is what are the guide rails that we uh, uh, think are appropriate to both harness but also support the innovation while establishing the basic uh, 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 tenets of, of regulation to protect people uh, and the industry. And that's, I, I think, the challenge, right? What, what's the right mix? Many of my colleagues often um, speak about, uh, you know, America, uh, American regulation, if we were to impose, how would that compare to China or uh, uh, the EU or, or Great Britain? I often go back to local because right now, absent federal uh, action, states are filling the field. And uh, that worries me to a, to a degree, but uh, for better or worse, New York State has been one of the, uh, one of the uh, states that has taken uh, sort of initial action uh, to develop a regulatory uh, structure. There are good points and bad points in the state's regulatory structure, and I think only because, Mr. Hall, you, you come, uh, you, you're, you're somewhat a New Yorker. Are you a New Yorker? Uh, <laughs> I, I thought I'd start with you, and, and perhaps just for our benefit, um, could you just speak to what perhaps are the, the, the strengths and weaknesses of a New York system, and if you'd like, uh, some of those other uh, tenets uh, that, that other states have imposed? Sure, uh, New, thank, and thank you very much. Um, New York has an, has an excellent regulator. DFS is an excellent regulator. They were out um, well, well ahead of, I think, the federal government and well ahead of many other governments in terms of coming up with a bit license back in, I think, now 2016 or 2017. Um, you know, that a lot of our clients have, have, have obtained, and, and I think it works quite well for what it does. Um, I, I will say that I'm aware of uh, businesses that have deliberately avoided um, uh, uh, serving, serving New York customers because of it. But look, I think with anything that, that operates, you know, over the internet, I, I think honestly that's, that's you know, while, while there's a huge uh, room for the state regulators to play, particularly in anti-fraud enforcement and and you know uh, payment services, money transmission, and things like that. You know, I think when you've got a business in the United States that's operating um, uh, you know a storefront on the internet, it really we we need federal legislation. We need we need legislation that that is going to apply consistently across the uh, across the country. Um, and, and not have a situation where, uh, you know, somebody who's a New York resident may be using a VPN to get around, uh, uh, you know, a firewall so that they can trade with somebody who maybe so, hasn't obtained that bit license. So I agree with you. The, the question that I have is, is can we, should we have a, uh, a system uh, that has uh, obviously not, fe I mean, not obviously, but, but perhaps not federal supremacy, but, but rather the sort of the dual banking model that exists now, fe Fed guide rails, state, uh, uh, state structure as well. Yes, or, I, think we, I, th I think we should, and I think you have to look at, at different kinds of digital assets in order to see, you know, where that works and, and, and where that's actually an improvement. For example, you know, if you're a stablecoin issuer, I, I think that you ought to be able to elect whether to have a federal charter or a state charter. Um, uh, you know, so I think there's there's definitely there's definitely room uh, for uh, uh, state state regulation like that. Okay. So um, uh, one of the challenges in creating the structure for digital assets is that, as as we understand, uh, many tokens vary widely in function and underlying value. 
Uh, in New York, uh, uh, there's a trust that offers what, what essentially is tokenized gold. Uh, it's a digital asset that has value. It's pinned to real allocated underlying gold bars in, London, in a London vault, which surprised, you know, was of interest to me, uh, not ETFs or, or futures. So purchasing the token is equivalent uh, of buying an ounce of physical gold. To any of you, um, perhaps, could you speak to the, to, to the tenets that would help in balancing uh, a regulatory structure that is clear and defined, but also flexible enough uh, to consider the actual underlying value of tokens? Anyone jump in my last 30 seconds? But I heard the chairman say he'd give you 20 extra. So I mean, um, the, the, the you know, CFTC background, the CFTC deals with those types of things, right? Where you've got, you've got an underlying commodity, then you do something on top of it, right? Now, the, the way you do the something on top of it impacts from a CFTC perspective under current law how it's regulated, right? I think the same principle applies, right? You know, when you're engaging in that type of asset, you want the same type of protections. And so you need a regime that, that allows you to define that asset in a way that people can understand, and then you know what regulatory regime applies to it. If well, I my time, add, I'm not sure, Mr. Chairman. Okay, go ahead. Very quickly, this is where the principles versus prescriptive method, I think, really comes in. It allows the principles to apply to the technology without restricting what the technology can do. Thank you. And Mr. Chairman, I, I appreciate, uh, yeah, not for your benefit, but the leadership of this subcommittee and the relationship with financial services. This is truly an exciting time if this country embraces uh, the innovation. Thanks. Thank you. Um, if uh, the ranking member has any closing comments, we'll turn to her at this time. Uh, thank you again, Mr. Chair, um, and uh, thank you to the panel for really what was a fascinating and enlightening discussion. You know, I think it's been very clear there's been a lot of evolution since the start of Bitcoin in 2009. There's volatility, um, in part because of this lack of a federal regulatory regime, um, and it's caused harm to, to customers um, because we haven't had appropriate regulation and oversight. Since 2014, the CFTC has played a role and should continue, I think, to play a role to ensure the safety, soundness, and orderly operation of these markets, um, but it's clear that Congress needs to enact appropriate legislative solutions. First, we need to address this regulatory gap that exists um, in digital commodity spot markets. Second, we need strong cu uh, customer protections that involve disclosures that are clear and material to the products in which customers are investing. And third, any legislative solution cannot succeed without providing these agencies with the sufficient funding resources that they need. Um, I think this is a, a little bit of a simplistic summa summary and no doubt there's going to uh, need to be um, many you know, complicated decisions as part of a legislative so solution that are going to take significant effort and focus um, and additional conversations. But I think that um, this is, is a great start for this committee, and I appreciate the majority's convening of the hearing today. Um, thank you so much once again uh, for your expertise and your valuable insights, and I look forward to future uh, conversations. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I yield back. Very well said, uh, Dr. Caraveo. I agree about the importance of closing the regulatory gap. You said that very well. The importance of disclosure being a part of that, you're exactly right. And I just want to thank the panelists for uh, each of you brought forth some real wisdom today. Uh, I agree we can't let the perfect be the enemy of good. I agree that principles-based regulation will allow innovation to flourish. We certainly don't want to stifle uh, the marketplace as we work to protect consumers. Um, you know, Mr. Hall, though, I think you uh, really nailed it uh, in your testimony. You mentioned that the lack of certainty, which is in no small part Congress's fault, has had real costs in consumer confidence and protection. It has caused foregone investment, lost economic activity, and it has reduced our ability to compete with foreign markets. This is why we've got to do our work, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it will not be easy. There will be uh, bickering over the contours of what actual legislation will look like. But I think the time is ripe for us to find something that strikes the right balance. And I look forward to doing this uh, in a bipartisan and uh, by subcommittee way. And uh, I think we're headed in the right direction. With that, the uh, record of this hearing will be open for 10 days as uh, members and our panelists are able to submit additional information. And unless anyone has anything else for the good of the order, this subcommittee will stand adjourned. <laughs>